about Nancy Pelosi and the Affordable Care Act. Thank you. First, I'd like to start by thanking Gus Peterson for um, putting this wonderful program together. And I have to admit, I'm a first-time offender. <laughs> And apparently, apparently a heretic, because I'm a pretty ahistorical a political scientist, so I've been taking copious notes. Thank you, I've learned a lot. Um, so I want to start with this. Healthcare, as we've already heard in several presentations, has been an ongoing issue in American politics for at least the last 60 years. Presidents from Eisenhower to Clinton to Bush to, to Obama have all struggled with how to achieve universal coverage, or at least a majority coverage. And given this, the passage of the Affordable Care Act becomes a, an interesting question as to how and why. Why now? Why did we pass the Affordable Care Act? You can't attribute it to some of the classic arguments of unified government, because we've had other times of unified government and presidents couldn't get it done. We can't attribute it to presidential emphasis, because we've had other presidents who put great emphasis on Healthcare and it didn't go anywhere. And we can't really attribute it to a greater need in the populace because we've also had extended periods with more people lacking coverage than we even did when we passed this. So why was Obama able to get this passed? I want to make the argument that it had not that much to do with Obama, and we can attribute the passage to Speaker Nancy Pelosi and her very distinctive feminine leadership style. If we look at the literature on gender and politics, of which there's quite a bit. It suggests to us that to be classified as a truly feminine leader, we would expect Pelosi to focus more on women's issues, which they define as issues affecting women, children, and families specifically. We would expect her to focus on task accomplishment which is gonna lead us into the willing to make compromise and the get things done, cut the deal mentality. Uh, we also would expect feminine leadership to include coalition building. And finally, to frame issues in terms of concrete examples and real people. And to give you the juxtaposition, we see male legislators tend to focus more on abstract policy ideas and female legislators tend to frame their arguments as classic examples of the real person. So the question I ask is, did Pelosi actually demonstrate feminine leadership and does this help us pass the Affordable Care Act? So first let's start with who is Nancy Pelosi and I'm going to try to answer it objectively unlike many in the political current realm might answer that question. Um, Nancy Pelosi, represents one of the most racially, ethnically, and religiously diverse districts in the country, San Francisco. So it's a tribute to her that she has been able to build and maintain a huge reelection constituency for years on end. She was born and raised in Baltimore in what we would have to classify as a very democratic home. If you don't know anything about Pelosi's family heritage, her father was a member of the house for several terms, but really came into his own personal glory, as he would describe it, as the mayor of Baltimore. And what did that look like to little Nancy, as she was referred to in the family? As young as age five, six, and seven, she reports uh, having to be dressed nicely to answer the door in case any constituents came by to explain what they needed from her father. And they kept a yellow pad by the door, which it was her and her siblings' job to write down who came to visit and what they needed. When she became a little bit older, it was her job to keep the files that they kept on who needed what and to whom to go to for the favor. Her parents' home was famous for being a meeting ground for anyone in the city, so not only did People show up and say, you know, my son needs a job, or goodness gracious, I, my so-and-so needs out of jail. Not only did they do that, but they stayed, and Nancy's mother fed them. So there's a big aspect of constituency services and treating constituency services as treating family. And this is very formative in Nancy's life. Even today, when you 
ask people how they would describe Nancy Pelosi. They would describe her as an unfaltering Democrat, a coalition builder, a tigress, or a lioness, she prefers the term lioness, because she's protecting her cubs, um, but also a hostess. If you've ever been to her office in the Capitol, um, even when she is, when she was speaker, and even when she isn't, there's a giant bowl of Ghirardelli chocolate, not only on her desk, but on the entrance to her office, because she believes it's her job to share a little sweetness of San Francisco <laughs> to everyone who comes to visit. So, okay, so does Pelosi actually exhibit these traits of a feminine legislator? First of all, women's issues. She has been a huge proponent of what we would classify as women's issues over the years. Uh, she's been a strong advocate for health care in that end. She was a leader in pushing for federal support during the AIDS, the beginning of the AIDS crisis, particularly the expansion of Medicaid coverage to AIDS victims, housing support for those suffering with AIDS, and she tackled the Reagan administration heartily on funding for research to understand the causes and treatment for AIDS. Uh, she's also so much of a force on women's and children's issues that when Peters and Rosenthal did an analysis of all her public speeches and her press releases for her period as speaker, they found that the term children and families represented 47% of the topics that she talked about over the entire period. She's constantly referencing families and children. She's a known human rights advocate. Um, when she visited China, she came as close as we've seen in a long time for a representative getting arrested as she held up a protest sign in Tiananmen Square for human rights. Um, she constantly refers to herself from the perspective of being a mother and a grandmother. Um, and she famously described her leadership of the House as occasionally having to use her mother of five voice. She's, well, I think we'll give her a check on the women's issue. Right? Uh, the other aspect of women's issues we want to talk about, or feminine leadership, would be task accomplishment and building coalitions. Pelosi has, been a, has a long and distinguished history of building great relationships with her fellow Democrats, long before she ever went to Congress. If you read any of the interviews with Pelosi, you'll see that she claims to never have really thought about running for office until she was asked to do so by one of her best friends who was dying, city con sitting Congresswoman Bella Smokes. So what brought her into these connections? Well, she saw her job as being a fundraiser for democratic politics for many years. And she was, has a long history of being a successful fundraiser. And to give you a sense of it, even though she's been safe in her district for years, she continues even today to be the most prolific fundraiser for the Democratic Party. And not only is she raising money for herself, but she, run, she raises money for all the other Democrats. She, and she will do it in whatever format works for them. So sometimes she makes appearances at their fundraisers Sometimes she doesn't, because that's better for them. She gives, she's willing to share her money. She's willing to share her connections. She's willing to host fundraisers of her own for other Democratic members. So think about that as occurring as early as the 1970s in San Francisco. She starts building these long-term relationships that are going to come to fruition when she's the speaker. Okay. Her control and use of the congressional committees and their procedures as speaker also uses these strategic alliances that she built over time. Um, as, she, as soon as she became speaker, one of the first things she did is she reinstated some of the authority back to committee chairs that had been gradually diminished under previous speakers. And when she did so, she strategically appointed committee chairs, thus empowering her own alliances in Congress. Okay? But in also in doing that, she recognized and continues to recognize, we'll see this as a theme throughout the Affordable Care Act, that she will have Democratic colleagues that have to vote their districts, which might disagree with Pelosi's agenda. So she's constantly trying to create a coalition where people can vote their district, but also support 
the agenda she's putting forth. Okay. So let's take a look at the Affordable Care Act. Where do we see these influences of feminine leadership? Well, I would argue the entire process of drafting the Affordable Care Act was a distinctly feminine legislative style. The Affordable Care Act was a, was a bill, but actually it was three bills written in three different committees. Ways and Means, Energy and Commerce, and Education and Warfare. Each were given jurisdiction to draft the bill. Hundreds of, hundreds, excuse me, of witnesses gave testimony. Hearings were held over a multi-year process. And each member of the House was given opportunities to offer amendments and modifications of, to the bill. All of this reflects a legislative strategy designed to be inclusive and coalition building. The inclusiveness uh, of her style can be seen in the healthcare summit, which was held at the beginning of the process. I don't know if you remember this process, but President Obama was giving was given credit for the healthcare summit, but it was Pelosi's suggestion to him. And what they did is they invited in key interest groups at the beginning of the process to inform the drafting of the legislation. So having players at the table like the AARP and the American Medical Association and the American Hospital Association created a sense of inclusion and involvement that helped significantly move that legislation through. Historically, those interest groups had always been opposed to healthcare reform. The sense of political timing that the time was now it was going to happen was distinctly there, and so they felt they had to participate, but also being included in the original drafting segment was helpful as well. But Pelosi's commitment to coalition building can also be seen in the details of the legislative process. So once the bills were being drafted, it became apparent that they were going to have an issue over the public option. The public option, which Pelosi really wanted, would have permitted anyone to buy into Medicare. Well, that sounds kind of familiar today, doesn't it? OK. Um, but the issues raised by the AMA was that the reimbursement rates provided by Medicare were going to be insufficient. And the hospital association pointed out that clinics and rural hospitals could be driven out of business by these low Medicare rates. Other critics feared the existence of subsidized health care would eventually drive private insurers out of business. Conservative Democrats were also concerned about the cost. They wanted to make sure the bill was fully funded. All of this fears about the public option were raised by Republicans in a very significant public opinion campaign, and they framed this as bankrupting the nation and eventually leading to government-managed health care, rationing of health care. You remember Sarah Palin and the death panels? Okay. So they took all these concerns about the bill and the Republicans went public with it, and very wisely they did it during the summer legislative break. So all the House members were home in their districts and they were having town hall meetings running into their constituents with these concerns. So Pelosi's response to that was to hold individual and group meetings with every single member of her Democratic caucus. <coughs> and in those meetings, she bought all three versions of the bill, put them on the table, and said, how do we build a coalition? What do you need? What works in this bill for you? What doesn't work in this bill for you? Okay. Additionally, to get consensus, she had a long-term credibility and she promised members that she would look out for them if they faced electoral pressures by, by agreeing with the bill. And she had the credibility and the cash to back it up. She also is gonna show her gender-based leadership in her willingness to compromise and be pragmatic in an attempt to achieve a policy solution. And specifically here, I would point to the issue of abortion in the Affordable Care Act. Abortion has long been an issue that challenged Pelosi because as a strong Catholic, she's personally against the practice, but as a staunch supporter of women's rights and representing such a liberal district, she's forced or electorally pressured into supporting a woman's right to choose. 
But in the Affordable Care Act, what happened is the pro-life members of Congress demanded that any individual who received any amount of support to cover their health care premiums, including the tax deduction, any individual who received any support to cover their health care premiums would not be permitted to use their health care services to access abortion. Additionally, it was their demand that there be no coverage for abortion services in the public office option, even in cases of medical need to save the mother's life. Needless to say, this is going to be strongly opposed by the more liberal components of the Democratic Party. At this point, the Republicans had already stated that they would absolutely not support the Affordable Care Act in any way. So Pelosi was forced to find a compromise between her own, the wings of her own party on this issue. So the compromise that she carried out was to include both of these aspects, these anti-choice aspects, in the bill. But to do it by letting them be brought forth as amendments. In doing so, it's very public, it's very visible, and all the members of her caucus can vote the way their districts would expect them to vote. And they're covered. She, she can build the alliance, build the coalition, and everybody votes their district simultaneously. Okay. We see the same kind of pragmatism and need to form a compromise in her procedural handling of the bill. One of the last possible steps for a bill is a motion to recommit. The motion to recommit can occur after the third reading of a bill and right before the speaker calls for a vote. Speakers preceding Pelosi had required their members to vote as a single unit on a motion to recommit. If the bill is sent back to committee in a motion to recommit, it gives the committee another chance to kill it. So Republican speakers preceding Pelosi had required all the other Republicans to always stick together and vote no, so that no Democrat could force a bill back into committee and thus kill it. Pelosi, on the other hand, allowed her members to vote their conscience. So they could again go back to their districts and say, I tried one more time to make the compromises in the bill or whatever that we needed. Okay. I want to contrast that to the legislative activity that we've seen in the last year and a half. Think about President Trump's tax bill. It was written, in essence, in secret. Even members of the Republican caucus were given less than a week to read the bill. They held no hearings on the bill. And the Republicans were mandated to vote for it. Otherwise, their president would have zero legislative act successes in his first year. If you think about Pelosi's leadership in that context, there's a dramatic contradiction. Okay. Pelosi's overall handling of the ACA demonstrates her commitment to policy accomplishment and party success over personal views or glory. The policy outcome was not the bill she would have preferred, but the same could be said for any member of Congress. Nobody got everything, but everybody got something. As Nancy personally would describe it, it's a lot like being a good mom. Make sure everyone is taken care of, no one is left out, and no one gets everything. This is a very feminist leadership style. Thank you.